We, uh, we meet at the beginning of the sesquicentennial, uh, the 150th anniversary of the start of the Civil War. The New York Times has begun a series of op-ed pieces which trace day by day the unfolding events of the secession crisis. The historians who have written for this series have stated without equivocation that the primary motive for secession was the South's desire to perpetuate slavery and white supremacy. On the other hand, there are a hundred websites and dozens of organizations, mostly but not exclusively in the South, which still insist that slavery and race had nothing to do with secession. It was all about state and personal rights. South Carolina, uh, true to its character, has staged a lily-white secession ball to celebrate the event. The governor of Texas recently threatened to secede, and some Tea Party chapters think they can avail themselves of Second Amendment rights to resist federal law. This was tried by Jefferson Davis and company in 1861 and worked out badly for them. The Civil War is the American Passover. Every generation since 1865 retells the tale as a way of placing itself in relation to a defining moment, perhaps the defining moment in the development of America as a modern nation state. The issues of that war have never ceased to be central to our national lives. What does it mean to be an American? And how broadly or narrowly do we define our, national, our nationality? What do we mean by equality and citizenship? What is the proper balance between the power of the nation state and the rights of its constituents? I mention this, not because I intend to go into all of that, but to explain why, as an American and as an American historian and novelist, I've been obsessed with the Civil War. I think that what we are as Americans is somehow bound up with that war, and that how we choose to remember it or forget it, forget about it, defines us. And for me, the Battle of the Crater is the single event that expresses and symbolizes the full range and complexity of the issues of the Civil War. My fascination with the war itself dates from uh, 1951, when I was nine years old, and my family took a driving trip south to Florida, stopping at the Gettysburg battlefield to pay homage to Lincoln, then passing through the segregated south. Bathrooms and drinking fountains marked white and colored, which for me was a shame-inducing introduction to the great contradiction of American life. I first read about the Battle of the Crater in the late 1950s in Bruce Catton's popular history of stillness at Appomattox. It stood out as something unique, an eerily modern battle, not an open field engagement with banners in the breeze, but a down and dirty episode of trench warfare like the Western Front in World War I. It was made possible by a spectacular feat of technology to undermine and blow up a Confederate strong point. Union soldiers dug what was then the longest mine in military history, and the explosion of four tons of gunpowder created what was then the largest explosion in uh, history, largest man-made explosion in history, sort of 1860s atom bomb. Finally, most significantly, this was the only major battle of the war in which the central issue of the Civil War, which is for me the issue of race, was directly engaged on the battlefield. Here briefly is the standard account of the battle as I received it. In the spring and summer of 1864, the Federal Army of the Potomac fought its way south through Virginia at terrible cost and casualties, only to be stymied at Petersburg, the vital rail junction south of the rebel capital of Richmond, by Confederate forces fighting from an impregnable trench line. Then the ingenuity of a regiment of Pennsylvania coal miners in General Burnside's Ninth Corps created the opportunity for a breakthrough. Directed by their colonel, a mining engineer in civilian life, they dug a tunnel more than 500 feet long right up under a Confederate strong point, packed it with four tons of blasting powder. Uh, when exploded, the mine would create a breach through which infantry could assault and uh, seize the high grounds 600 yards beyond and from there capture Petersburg. Burnside believed that the three veteran infantry divisions uh, uh, with, uh, manned by white troops in his corps were too weakened and demoralized by combat losses to carry the uh, battle with the required spirit and energy. So to lead the attack, Burnside chose his fourth division, nine regiments of African-American soldiers, 
the largest black military formation to that point in our history. The division was given special training in the maneuvers required to exploit the breach that the mine would create. The operation was designed to achieve a decisive victory. More than that, it seemed to draw upon the unique strengths of the Union, its mastery of industrial technology, the voluntarism and skill of free labor, the moral and physical energy liberated by its embrace of emancipation. But all this planning, labor, and hope ended in embarrassing defeat. It was not just the skill and courage of the Confederate defenders that wrecked the assault, but the racism, jealousy, incompetence, and cowardice of federal generals. First, only 36 hours before the mine went up, General Meade, Burnside's superior, refused to let him use the black division as the spearhead for which it had been trained. His reasons were a combination of political fear and racial prejudice. He didn't think black troops could fight. Burnside, in a funk, had his other division commanders draw straws for the assignment, and the winner was James Ledley, a drunk and a coward who would hide in a bunker during the battle. The mine exploded, throwing up a giant mushroom cloud of fire, smoke, and debris, both human and inert, creating a huge sheer-sided crater 30 feet deep and 150 feet wide, surrounded by a wide debris field. But instead of charging through the breach and storming the high ground, Ledley's men became disorganized and failed to advance beyond the mid vicinity of the crater. Uh, I, I uh, later found while researching it uh, that uh, Ledley actually gave false orders to his men. He told them to go to the crater and hold on instead of attack, because either because he was drunk during the command conference or because he was afraid to carry the attack order through. What should have been a breach became a bottleneck as Burnside kept idiotically piling troops into the zone already jam-packed with Ledley's men. Confederate artillery pinned them down. Confederate infantry reinforcements uh, uh, formed up for a counterattack. After the battle was hopelessly lost, Burnside finally sent in the Black Division, which attacked with courage but was routed by a Confederate counterattack. Hundreds of Federal soldiers were trapped for four hours in the huge, sheer-sided crater left by the mine explosion without water or food in 100-degree heat, packed like sardines in a can, helpless to defend themselves. The Confederates stormed the crater, and the closing phase of the battle was marked by a combination massacre and race riot as white troops, both Union and Confederate, murdered black soldiers, uh, including wounded and prisoners of war. In the mid-1970s, I got the idea of using the crater battle as a kind of entering wedge to propose a revisionist, what would then have been, a revisionist interpretation of the character and meaning of the Civil War. I had recently finished my first book on the origins of the uh, myth of the frontier, and I believe that the Civil War is a close second to that myth uh, in establishing uh, the, uh, uh, the character of, of, of American, uh, American culture. The centennial of the Civil War itself was just recently passed, and it had produced a huge outpouring of celebratory histories. And that centennial had exactly coincided with the crisis of the civil rights movement, dubbed the Second Reconstru Reconstruction, rich with ironic analogies to the Civil War, best symbolized by Martin Luther King's speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Finally, this was the heyday of what was then called the new social history, whose practitioners made visible the life and history of the so-called invisible classes, especially slaves and workers of 19th century America. I thought of the book as a way of using the insights of the new social history and the moral perspective of the civil rights movement to critique and revise the conventional and self-congratulatory commemoration of those centennial histories. I would play the mythic civil war of flags and gallantry, gone with the wind and the Gettysburg Address, against the reality that a war fought to preserve free labor produced instead a new order of industrialization and wage slavery, and that the war that ended slavery produced in its place the violent and oppressive system known as Jim Crow. Among the many ironies of the battle is the fact that the regiment of coal miners who dug the great mine was raised in the Schuylkill Valley of uh, Pennsylvania, which after the war was the uh, center of the violent struggle between unionized miners and the coal barons, uh, and uh, the, where the Molly Maguires uh, figured on the, uh, on the miners' side. And the colonel who commanded the regiment 
later headed the Coal and Iron Police, which was the union busting uh, uh, police force uh, in the coal fields. Uh, and of course, the massacre at the battle's end was for me predictive of the defeat of Reconstruction by the violence of Southern whites and the acquiescence of Northern whites. And of all these things, as Melville says, the Battle of the Crater, like Ahab's white whale, was the symbol. I wanted to use the battle as the focus of the study because the idealization of battle is so central to the mythic civil war, but also because I believed that in a narrative of military operations, it might be possible to trace a direct connection between the big ideas of ideology and politics that move the thought and action of the elites and the labor and violence of those at the end of the chain of command who become the agents or executors of those big ideas. However, my idea for a nonfiction treatment of the battle foundered on the limitation of source materials. There was plenty of material on slaves and coal miners in general, but not much that specifically related to the men and units that fought at the crater. So instead of writing a history, I wrote a novel called The Crater. I had two literary models for this project. Uh, Got to pick your models well. Tolstoy's War and Peace, Start at the Top, and Norman Mailer's Naked and the Dead. In the end, it was Mailer's approach rather than Tolstoy's that I adopted. There would be no omniscient narrator to provide an authoritative explanation of unfolding events. Rather, I used the events of the battle as described in the standard histories and the official records of the War of the Rebellion as a grid within which I developed a set of fictional characters who would experience the action from a range of racial, social, and tactical viewpoints. The germ of each character was drawn from the new materials made available by the social historians, especially Herbert Gutman's work on slaves and industrial workers, which combined sophisticated social analysis with rich citation from the letters and journals of the people that he had studied. But each character had to integrate the data into a coherent personality, a distinct subjectivity through whose biased eyes the reader would vicariously live the, his the history I was recounting. For each character, I had to develop a distinctive language of consciousness and evoke that character's special world of reference, his culture of origin. Then show how that consciousness, that world sense, shaped his response to the overriding and inescapable question of the war. How and why should I fight or refuse to fight? And why is it that I persist in fighting under conditions that have become increasingly desperate, cruel, and demoralizing? Perhaps the leaders who spoke for the interests of planters on the one side, bankers and industrialists on the other, saw the war as a means of protecting their property and vital interests. But for most private soldiers, military service entailed serious economic sacrifice. The small farmers who made up most of the rank and file left their farms to be run by wives and children or aged parents. Fewer and weaker hands meant less food for their families, less surplus for the market, less cash to maintain the farm, pay debts or rent. White laborers and factory workers who enlisted gave up their jobs with no assurance of reemployment. Yet they volunteered to serve, and most of them re-enlisted when their term of service was up. And those who voted in 1864 gave large majorities to candidates who favored continued prosecution of the war. Among many motives for this level of commitment, one seemed and still seems to me to be critical. North and South, white Americans shared the belief that the constitutional government established by the founders was and was meant to be an instrument for assuring justice, political rights, safety of property, and personal dignity to all citizens. The casting of ballots in election was a secular sacrament, an affirmation and a guarantee of the individual's self-respect, moral independence, and social dignity. In their language, to be deprived of that right, that sacrament, was to be treated like a slave. To the South, the election of a Republican president signaled that the people of the North intended to use the power of the government to undermine and destroy the slave-based system of plantation agriculture on which their culture, society, and politics were built. A transformation to which they could not freely consent would be imposed on them. To accept that result would be to acquiesce in their own enslavement. There was a corresponding belief in the North, which saw secession as simply an attempt by Southern aristocrats 
to overturn the result of a free democratic election by force, overriding ballots with bullets. To consent to secession was to abandon the defense of their own political freedom, to act as if they deserved to be treated as slaves. And these feelings, powerful enough in themselves, were intensified by the fears and antipathies attached to racial difference. In a nation half slave and half free, enslavement was more than a metaphor for a hateful condition of life. It was a living, visible fact. On both sides, men were willing to kill and be killed to defend the fundamental ground of their identity, their personal and collective dignity. That is, their standing as free white men, their difference from black people. To lose one's liberty, to have one's rights traduced, was to fall into the condition of the Negro, to lose one's social and racial identity, to become something less than human. The emotional charge of that difference can only be expressed in the word those people preferred, the word nigger. So in the novel, I created a set of characters whose social positions and attitudes represented a range of possible responses to this racialized social order, and did flashback biographies, which set each personality in its special social and cultural frame. I developed for each character an appropriate language, a personalized vocabulary, reflecting his world of references and its values, and his personal take on those values. The moral decisions each makes in the heat of battle are shaped by the consciousness he brings to it, that is, are shaped by the moral and cultural vocabulary with which I have provided him. For example, for my three Southern enlisted men, the world of reference is one in which, as small farmers, they have struggled to maintain their economic independence from the local plantation magnate, who is also naturally, inevitably, the colonel of the regiment. The war has made their families poorer, and every combat casualty that the regiment suffers means another farm engrossed by the planter. They picture this menace as a scene in which gangs of the colonel's black slaves break down their fences and swarm over their farms, see the blacks as hateful, inhuman instruments of that power. The terms of this picture are echoed in the way each man responds to the battlefield confrontation with the black troops, and the echo makes it possible for the attentive reader to discover a kind of explanation for why each man responds as he does. However, as a novelist, I do not insist that the reader make that explanatory connection. The novel displays, but does not explicitly resolve, the tension between history as lived and history as understood. Writing the crater as fiction also allowed me to imaginatively cross the color line, to present the conflict through the eyes and consciousness of black characters. No history of the Civil War can be well told without that perspective but sources on the black military experience were very thin in the 1970s. 35 years later, the situation is much improved, but for reasons that we can discuss if you're interested, there is still almost nothing in the way of personal statement by the black soldiers who fought at the crater. The strength of the fictional approach was its ability to approximate a representation of history as lived. The weakness of the method was that the event itself could only be represented in personal terms, so that the massacre, the culminating event of the novel, seems to emerge from individual choices, while the institutional causes, the role of uh, political leaders, uh, uh, legal, uh, law, the law of war, and so on, fade into the background, becomes, a, becomes a, a pers uh, an exercise in, in personal bigotry, uh, ra uh, rather than uh, something that has a kind of official imprimatur to it. That was uh, 1980 when I, the novel came out. Three years ago, after some time to think about it, Random House asked me to do a nonfiction book on the Battle of the Crater. Now I discovered that there was a huge amount of new information of the kind I lacked when I wrote the novel, and a lot of it is even available online. I was therefore able to construct a more detailed and accurate account of the tactical battle itself by carefully going through these official records and letters, of re letters and reminiscences of officers and men who part actually participated in the battle, correlating their accounts with what of what happened and when it happened, and locating where my sources were positioned on the field by using really good maps, which are now available and weren't available at the time. In effect, I applied 
some of the same techniques and imaginative resources I had used in the novel to a far richer body of eyewitness testimony and physical evidence than had been available 35 years earlier to describe the tactical action as it unfolded hour by hour. However, the social and cultural material that was foregrounded in the novel, that is the life of the people uh, on, on the farms and factories, now became merely background to a narrative of the battle. However, th this new perspective also opened up aspects of the event that I had not appreciated before when I was novelizing. What I discovered was that the standard accounts of the battle in, in Civil War histories, the accounts that I had used in the novel, had oversimplified or misrepresented the actual tactical course of the Union attack and the reasons for its failure, and above all had either minimized the extent or char and character of the racial massacre or deliberately suppressed it. If anyone is interested in what I discovered about the tactical battle, then when I've, almost nobody ever is, I'd be more than happy to talk about it in the Q&A. But for now, what I want to do is focus on the most significant aspect of the event, which is the combat performance of the black troops and the massacre. Because the new research that I did confirmed the thesis which I had imagined in the novel, that slavery and race are indeed central matter of the Civil War at both the highest level and at the, uh, the operational level, let's call it. The research also highlighted the extent to which the historiography of the crater battle and Civil War military history in general has been and, in my view, remains Jim Crow history. In 1864, the combat performance of black troops at the crater was regarded as a test of the military aptitude of the Negro race. General Grant asserted that had the black division been allowed to spearhead the attack, the battle would have ended in victory. But the army as a whole blamed the black division for the defeat and concluded that blacks were unfit for major combat. Most historians have treated their performance more sympathetically, but also patronizingly. They generally represent the black division as hapless victims of Burnside's incompetence and the rage of the Confederates. In fact, as I discovered, the performance of the black division by every measure was the strongest of any federal unit on the field, in part because they had been trained to make the assault and knew how to handle the confusions that they found in front of them, but largely because they had very high morale and, uh, and had been imbued with a determination to close with the enemy. Uh, and in Civil War, when you close with the enemy, you close with the enemy. It's face to face. When they finally advanced, at the end of the battle, they had to face much heavier fire than the white troops that had gone over before them. They had to work their way through the log jam of demoralized white troops around the crater before they could even deploy for combat. Yet, despite all this, they achieved the only notable success of the day, storming a Confederate strong point with the bayonet and capturing 150 South Carolinians and four battle flags. They advanced further and fought harder than any other division on the field, and therefore, when the battle was lost, they had the farthest to go to get back to their own lines. For those reasons, they suffered the heaviest losses of any federal division, although they were in action for the shortest time. Ledley's division, which was under fire the longest, lost 18% killed, wounded, and missing. The black division lost 31% killed, wounded, and missing. Moreover, the ratio of killed to wounded was much higher for the blacks than for any other units on the field. White divisions lost four wounded for every man killed. Black troops, 1.8 wounded for every man killed. In a typical Civil War battle, 20% of those initially listed as missing in action would later be found to have been killed. For the black troops at the crater, 59% in that category were later found to have been killed in action. The reason for this disparity is that many black wounded were murdered by Confederate soldiers after the position was overrun. The action reports written by Union officers and memoirs published in the post-war decades made it clear that something like a massacre had occurred. However, the Army never officially acknowledged the fact, and it is not referred to in the testimony given to the Court of Inquiry after the battle or the congressional hearings held in 1865. An article about the massacre by Major George Kilmer was published in Century Magazine in 1887, 
as part of the series of articles that later became Battles and Leaders of the Civil War, the great multi-volume compendium. Uh, but Kilmer's article was not included in the book version of the series. Bruce Catton's Stillness at Appomattox, published in 53, 1953, is more thorough and accurate in its treatment of the role of blacks than any account written between 1864 and the 1990s. However, in his masterwork, the three-volume centennial history of the Civil War, Catton does not even mention the massacre. The Southern novelist historian Shelby Foote, featured as a talking head on Ken Burns' The Civil War, makes no mention of the massacre in his three-volume pro-Southern narrative history of the Civil War. James McPherson, in Battle Cry of Freedom, now the standard one-volume history, says only that several blacks were killed after the surrender. Noah Trudeau, in his 1991 study of the Peterburg, Petersburg campaign, ignored the statistical work done by his own research assistant, Bryce Sudero, which showed that a large-scale massacre has occur, had occurred. Sudero's own study was not published until 2007. That's what I call Jim Crow history. The suppression whether willful or neglectful, of history is experienced on the black side of the color line. The minimalization or erasure of facts or events which challenge the master narratives of our myths of nationality. The revisionism that has reconstructed social history since the 60s has not substantially changed things in the field of military history. And since the mythic Civil War, the Civil War of memory and reenactment is mainly a tale of battles. This weakness in revision has left most of the sacred and sanctifying symbols intact. The war as such is remembered as essentially a white man's war with a cameo by the 54th Massachusetts. A war between white brothers. Southern generals, especially Robert E. Lee and his lieutenants, are remembered as chivalric heroes of a lost cause. Even those not enamored of the Confederacy present them as nobler than the cause they served. A closer look will suggest a different view. In the novel, I focused on what might be called grassroots racism, the racism of individuals arising from cultural and personal circumstances which found murderous expression in the heat of battle. But I was unable to fully novelize the extent to which official policy and political agitation created the conditions in which a massacre could occur. This aspect of the event acquired new salience for me in the years after the novel appeared because of the research I did uh, in, in the late 80s on the My Lai Massacre, uh, which had become emblematic of the Vietnam War. But let me begin at the grassroots. The social and cultural order of race-based plantation slavery set the psychological preconditions for massacre. Fundamental principle of that order was the absolute division of black and white, slave and free, into different orders of humanity, one of which is absolutely abject in relation to the other. That principle was formulated in law in a form best defined by Justice Rutledge of the North Carolina Supreme Court in a precedent-setting 1829 case. The slave, he wrote, is one doomed in his own person and his posterity to live without the capacity to make anything his own, to toil that another may reap the fruits. He surrenders his will in implicit obedience to that of another. Such obedience is the consequence only of uncontrolled authority over the body. The power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. The slave, to remain a slave, must be made sensible that there is no appeal from his master, that his power is in no instance usurped, but is conferred by the laws of man, at least, if not the law of God. Custom extended to all white men a, dilu a diluted form of that power. Plantations were not isolated like the Soviet gulag. Slaves and free whites met and interacted in the towns and fields. Poor whites were reconciled to a planter-dominated economy by the acknowledgment that as white people they enjoyed a social status and a dignity absolutely denied blacks. As Governor Joe Brown of Georgia put it, they belonged to, quote, the only true aristocracy, the aristocracy of white men, unquote. For white men in that society, the very idea, let alone the sight, of black men armed in resistance was an outrageous assault on the social order and their personal dignity. Imagine the following scene. It is any year from 1820, certainly to 1860, and you could probably take it to the 1960s. In a southern city, a white man and a black man approach each other on a sidewalk. The black man walks up to the white man and punches him in the nose. The affront is almost unimaginable in that setting. The social order shakes. Only the most violent punishment can restore the balance of terror 
on which social control depends. But if the injured man, the white man, waits for society to punish the black, the law to punish, if he fails to answer the bow below quickly or to punish it with greater violence, he loses his own dignity, his standing in the community. He falls out of the aristocracy of white men and becomes more like the despised Negro. Now imagine that individual confrontation socialized and magnified, a regiment of white men confronted by masses of black men armed with intent to do harm. Not only would it be a disgrace to grant quarter to those black men, it would be worse disgrace to accept quarter from them, to throw oneself on their mercy. And many uh, Confederate soldiers would say that they expected to be murdered if they ever fell into the hands of black troops. But it's a mistake to see such a response as characteristic only of the southern lower classes. Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy and author of its constitution, spoke for the southern elite when he declared that white supremacy is the cornerstone, his word, of a Confederate government. A state, quote, founded on the great truth that the Negro is not the equal of the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and moral condition, unquote. The appearance of black men in Union Army Blue was an assault on this fundamental principle. As Georgia Senator Howell Cobb told Jefferson Davis, quote, the day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong, unquote. Confederate elite responded by adopting policies that denied the legitimacy of black military enlistment, in effect treating them as enemy combatants rather than uh, POWs. President Davis proposed that Union officers captured leading black troops be charged under state law with inciting slave rebellion, a crime generally punishable by death. The Confederate Congress considered a bill for, quote, raising the black flag, asking and giving no quarter, unquote, in future battles. General Beauregard was most eager that the bill be enacted, quote, has the bill for execution of abolition prisoners of ne uh, after the first of next January been passed? It is high time to proclaim the black flag that the execution be with the garrote, unquote. The Lincoln administration threatened retaliations if these, if retaliation if these policies were enacted. And the Confederate Congress therefore chose not to pass the black flag bill. However, both President Davis and his Secretary of War, James Seddon, authorized the killing and or enslavement of black POWs. Seddon sent an order to commanders in the field that black soldiers and their officers should be, quote, dealt with red-handed on the field or immediately thereafter, unquote, rather than taken alive and held for trial and execution on the correct assumption that if that were done, the Lincoln administration might retaliate, but it would not retaliate if the killing were done in secret. That the policy would be carried out was demonstrated a few months before the crater when Confederate troops massacred blacks at Fort Pillow, Tennessee and Plymouth, North Carolina. In the latter incident, North Carolina troops of Ransom's Brigade, which, who later participated in the Crater Massacre, killed more than 125 black soldiers and civilians after the town surrendered. As one of Ransom's soldiers said, quote, our brigade did not need orders to make them give no quarter, as it is understood amongst us that we take no Negro prisoners, unquote. However, orders were given to shoot several black POWs by firing squad, four days after the battle. These orders came from Governor Vance of North Carolina and were approved by President Davis, who warned the officers in charge to keep it out of the papers. With the highest authorities in the Confederate government and society approving the murder or mistreatment of black POWs, it's hardly surprising that troops in the field felt that racial murder was not only justified but praiseworthy. Um, Though federal authorities protested, Lincoln never did approve retaliation in kind because he feared to start a spiral of retaliations, and he feared that the northern public would not tolerate the execution of white men for the sake of black men. Um, instead, what was created was an atrocity spiral. Southern troops acted on the expectation that black troops could and should be shown no quarter. Every time they acted on that presumption, they reinforced it. Confederates who participated in massacres affirmed and accepted the idea that their, their deeds made them liable to similar treatment by black soldiers, which increased the motive for, uh, for murder. They were not wrong. Union soldiers serving in colored regiments were convinced that they could expect no quarter, 
Self-interest and the logic of manhood therefore justified them in refusing quarter to Confederates. When the 29th Colored Troops, one of the regiments that fought at the crater, left Chicago, its home base, the local paper said, quote, these colored troops should take no prisoners until the massacre at Fort Pillow is avenged. Their Colonel John Bross echoed that sentiment in his speech. When I lead these men into battle, we shall expect no quarter and shall not ask quarter. Thus, in both armies, there was an expectation that the presence of black troops ensured and permitted a battle without mercy. Because the murder of black troops and, uh, was officially sanctioned and socially approved, Confederate soldiers made no effort to conceal the fact that a massacre has occurred. In fact, they took pride in describing it. So most of the eyewitness testimony about the massacre is Confederate testimony. Colonel John Haskell observed, quote, our men who were always made wild by having Negroes sent against them were utterly frenzied with rage. Nothing in the war could have exceeded the horrors that followed. No quarter was given, and for what seemed a long time, fearful butchery was carried on, unquote. Private William Day of the 49th North Carolina remembered how Negro skulls cracked under the blows of musket butts like eggshells, and another soldier observed that the path to the reel was clogged with broken-headed Negroes. Not every soldier joined in. Private Dorsey Binion of the 48th Georgia regretted that some few Negroes went to the rear as we could not, could not kill them fast enough as they went past us. His comrade, Noble Brooks, was deeply upset. Oh, the depravity of the human heart that would cause men to cry out no quarters in battle or not show any when asked for. In the Alabama Brigade, a lieutenant found the killing heart sickening and tried to stop it, but his comrade, Captain Featherston, apologized to his wife for having taken Negro prisoners instead of killing them all, but, quote, we will not be held culpable when it is considered the numbers we had already slain. Uh, much of the battle took place long after the frenzy of the fighting was over. Black POWs were marched to the rear, and as they did so, they encountered Confederates uh, going into or out of the fighting who uh, killed them out of hand. Confederate Colonel Porter Alexander said, quote, some Negro prisoners were afterwards shot by others, and there was without doubt a great deal of unnecessary killing. Captain, later Colonel William Pegram, was not disturbed. He, he advocated the murder of all captured blacks as, quote, perfectly proper and necessary as a matter of policy, unquote, because it clarified the racial basis of the Southern struggle for independence. He took satisfaction in the belief that fewer than half the blacks who surrendered, quote, ever reached the rear. You could see them lying dead all along the route. Confederate leader, leadership also subjected to the prisoners to public humiliation. Uh, none of this, by the way, reported in any of the, the, the histories. Parading them through the streets of Petersburg, black prisoners stripped to their underwear, the whites forced to march side by side with them, the ultimate humiliation from a southern point of view, while crowds jeered and threw things. Although all the memoirs written by captured Union officers refer to this event, none of the standard histories of the war or the Petersburg campaign mention it. Yet it says a good deal about the moral character of the Confederate high command, especially the revered figure of Robert E. Lee. This disgraceful spectacle was organized by General A.P. Hill, the senior corps commander under Lee, with Lee's knowledge, if not his order, if not at his order. Lee was also silent about the murders done on the battlefield although he was certainly aware of them. His silence in both of these cases was permissive. It's worth noting that one of the charges, war crimes charged against Saddam Hussein uh, in 1991 was his making public display of captured American soldiers. The law of war in 1864 did not criminalize such behavior, but it was clearly and intentionally a violation of what they called the protocols and customs governing civilized warfare. Equally disturbing, was the eyewitness testimony that white Union troops turned on their black comrades and murdered them as the rebels were making their final assault. As one sergeant put it, quote, we was not about to be taken prisoner amongst them niggers, unquote. It was said that the murderers believed the rebels' policy, exemplified by Fort Pillow, was to kill whites captured with black troops, so they killed their black comrades to affirm their kinship with their white enemies. Northern racism had a different social basis from the Southern variety, but was no less deadly. Um, uh, some of the prejudice was simply naive. There's a, a, one of the more admirable characters is a, is a young 17-year-old white officer uh, 
in the black troops named uh, uh, Freeman Bowley, who said, uh, I couldn't believe how black the men were. I never imagine, imagined that men could be so black. And then he said that after a few days, they did not seem so black to me anymore. So some of it is naive racism. But even the guys who are working with the blacks, commanding the blacks, trying to get them uh, advanced, use the language of racism. A colonel of one colored regiment praised his trainees as in these terms, yesterday a filthy repulsive nigger, today a neatly attired man, yesterday a slave, today a freeman, yesterday a civilian, today a soldier. And this is a man who risked his life and his standing with his fellow officers to lead blacks in combat. The prejudice in the North was uh, powerful and prevalent, particularly among uh, 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 the uh, Midwesterners of Southern origin all through the uh, Ohio Valley and the Irish Catholics of the, uh, the cities. Uh, 1863, there was a huge draft riot which became a race riot uh, in New York. But the, uh, in the vicinity of the, the crater battle, this racial prejudice, which, was, which had been there, was whipped up into a fever pitch in the summer of 1864 because the Democratic Party was trying to defeat Lincoln's reelection by playing the race card. Democrats' platform was described by one of its partisans as, quote, the Constitution as it is, the Union as it was, and the niggers where they are, unquote. It called for a peace settlement with the South that would rescind the, De the Emancipation Proclamation and restore to slavery most of the blacks freed by it. It also demanded the immediately dismissal of all blacks currently in, in, in Union military service, which at that point in the war might have amounted to between 15 and 20 percent of the Union force. Democratic publicists sought to strengthen the public distaste for racial equality by elaborating the vile associations of the word nigger. The editor, the editor of New York's leading Catholic weekly declared, quote, if the president called upon them to go carry on a war for the nigger, he'd be damned if he believed they would go, unquote. The editors of the New York World produced a pamphlet, Miscegenation, the Theory of the Blending of the Races, the first time that word was used, which purported to be a Republican policy paper calling for the forced amalgamation of the Irish and Negro races. Appearing as it did a year after the draft riots, the hoax was tantamount to an incitement to further violence, as well as a dishonest appeal for Irish votes. Another Democratic journal dubbed Lincoln Abraham Africanus I, and suggested that he had, quote, a taint of Negro blood, unquote, which explained, quote, his brutal and obscene habits. Thanks to him, filthy black niggers, greasy, sweating, and disgusting, now jostle white people and even ladies everywhere. The prejudice was bipartisan. Republican conservatives like cabinet officers Montgomery Blair opposed slavery, but shared the Democrats' revulsion for Negro equality. Blair actually tried to unite conservatives of both parties against the radicals, who uh, Blair calls the miscegenators, to, quote, preserve this exclusive right of government in the white race, unquote. When white soldiers turned against their black comrades in arms in the crater, they may have been driven by fear of Confederate retaliation. But what made it possible for them to actually kill their fellow soldiers was the belief, the feeling that black people were not fully human that contact with them was polluting. And this hateful sentiment was cultivated and exploited by political leaders, North as well as South, who made it an acceptable motive for violence. It's a good thing nobody talks like that these days. In writing The Battle of the Crater as fiction and as history, I was drawn into an intense imaginative engagement with a particular event, a particular time and place, and also more largely, an imaginative engagement with the subject of war. I think this is a neglected subject in the academy, and that when academic scholars address the subject, they tend to dissolve the experience into large analytical categories, colonialism, racism, masculinity, capitalism, early, middle, modern, late, whatever. We may not approve of war, but we still need to study it. As Trotsky is supposed to have said, quote, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. In studying war, I've tried to attend to the large ideas and forces that move politically empowered classes to choose and make war, but also to see how those large ideas take effect in what might, we might call the workplace of war, the combats in which human beings individually and collectively enact under extreme stress the will of their leaders and the values of their culture. I tried to do this in the crater in no quarter, 
slightly larger scale in lost battalions. I'm not sure I found the right way to tell the story, but here's what I've learned about how to attempt the telling of it. The historian explains, using evidence and argument to persuade the reader the explanation is valid, which is what I've just mainly been doing about the massacre, with my tale of the massacre. The novelist persuades, if at all, by demonstration, by the vivid representation of events as they might well have been experienced by those who suffered them. I consider it lucky that circumstances led me to write the crater as fiction before I was able to write it as history. If I had known then all that I subsequently learned, all that stuff I just laid out for you, I think the novelistic imperative to imagine would have given way to the historian's desire to explain. Not even Tolstoy could keep those two imperatives in harmony. I always skipped the, his explanation. Writing the novel required a disciplined engagement with the task of imagining events from the inside as if one were a participant, thinking in the language of the time and place, seeing and acting with no foreknowledge of the outcome or its possible significance. I think that discipline served me well in the analysis of the real world action. It heightened my awareness of the subjectivity of the actors, of the contingency that shapes events, the complex interplay of subjects and powers and forces, and the necessity of always integrating the soldier's fight, the general's battle, and the politician's war. Thank you.